Hey guys, today I got a, another fantastic guest. Uh, so happy to that he agreed to be on. Uh, Jonathan Haidt, how are you, sir? I'm doing fine, Dad. Please call me John, of course. Oh, thank not, you. Not sir. Sir. <laughs> uh, I wanted to, so, some people might not know who you are, so I thought I would just do a very brief introduction. You're the Thomas Cooley Professor of Ethical Leadership at NYU's Stern School of Business. Uh, I had a cousin who was in the mid-80s a professor there in economics. Then he went on to be a head honcho at the World Bank. His name was uh, Itzhak Diwan. Uh, but I, it, this was way before your time. Way before my time. Uh, top 100 global thinker in 2012 by Foreign Policy Magazine. Damn. Uh, one of the 65 world thinkers of 2012 by Prospect Magazine. 90-plus academic articles. 34,000-plus Google Scholar citations. Makes many of us very envious. And then author of two books, The Happiness Hypothesis, Finding Modern Truth and Ancient Wisdom, and your more recent uh, New York Times bestseller, The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Dad. So I thought we would start, I know that uh, much of your career, you've, you've had some sort of permeating theme relating to morality. And so I thought I would start off by first talking about the tension between science and religion. And so some people mm -hmm. argue that there's no way to reconcile these things. Other people who are a bit more diplomatic and charitable, like say Stephen Jay Gould, the late paleontologist from Harvard, proposed the NOMA principle, non-overlapping mm -hmm. magisteria, where things can exist in separate domains and co cohabitate, if you'd like. And many people argue that morality is within the sphere outside of science, whereas you and I would argue that no, of course, it could be within the purview of science. And more specifically, we could study it from an evolutionary perspective. So tell us what your thoughts are on this issue. Yes. So um, when I, I grew up, uh, I, I'm Jewish. I uh, had a bar mitzvah. Uh, about a year later, I began thinking that there's no God and what are the implications of this? Um, it just didn't make any sense to me that there could be a god of the sort that I'd been told about. And so by the time I was 15 or 16, I was an atheist that plunged me into an existential depression about, oh my God, there's no meaning to life, like a Woody Allen sort of, you know, the universe is expanding, but Alfie, Brooklyn isn't expanding. Um, so uh, I actually majored in philosophy in the hope of finding the meaning of life. Uh, that was a complete waste of time. Philosophy had nothing to say about it at the time. Um, and I ended up going to graduate school in psychology, studying morality. That was the topic I picked right away in my first year of grad school. Um, and as I started looking at morality from a cross-cultural perspective, I was reading a lot of ethnographies uh, with an anthropologist, Alan Fisk, and I reread the Bible, the Old Testament. And boy, it's all about, well, you know, don't kill, don't steal, but, you know, don't lie down with a menstruating woman. And, uh, you know, so much about skin and skin lesions and, and all this stuff about the body. And from a very superficial perspective, it kind of makes sense from a, like, it looks like disease stuff. Like, you know, the people of Israel shall follow these laws, and some of them have to do with disease. Um, so instantly, I started getting interested in the emotion of disgust. And that was really why I got into disgust, is that all these ancient texts and ancient religions, Hinduism, Islam, they all make a big deal about the body. And, and in Western secular culture, we don't think that stuff is morality. That's just like hygiene. Um, so that was my entree into studying religion. And gradually, as I uh, began to look at it from an evolutionary perspective and also from a cultural perspective, um, I sort of lost my hostility to religion. I began to just see it as an aspect of our groupishness. So I study religion, morality, politics. And if I had another hand, I'd say maybe even sports. Like you look at all those things as just manifestations of our evolved tribal nature. So I think they're all really interreconcilable. And now, so do you, do you view, so that there's a tension amongst evolutionists when it comes to religion as mm -hmm. to whether religion is itself an adaptation, and there are some compelling arguments for that perspective, mm -hmm. while others argue that it's a byproduct, it's an exaptation. Where do you fall in this debate? So, yeah, so I, I think that the idea that it begins with uh, that exaptation business about we have, uh, uh, you know, an intention, what is it? Uh, the um, Agency. Agency, yeah, the hyperactive agency detector. That makes perfect sense to me. So I'm with those people, but evolution is so fast. You know, like we used to think that 50,000 years was like nothing, but no, you know, there's been a lot of evolution in the last 10,000 years. Um, so if you propose that, that, that the hyperactive agency detector was already present in our species d before the diaspora from Africa, then it would take an act of willful, I don't know what, to say, 
this exaptation is in our minds, and then there's no further evolution. So we have this mistake, this hyperactive agency detector, but there's no further evolution. Well, of course there's further evolution. So once people start making up gods, the groups that made up a god that had some social benefits for cohesion or military effectiveness or reproduction, they outproduce the others, and we are their descendants. So, um, so I'm very much an adaptationist. Um, I uh, the most controversial part is that I think that we have some bit of group selection. I was going to say exactly that that you're you're yeah. entering the forbidden zone amongst yeah. many evolutionary psychologists. By by the way, David Sloan Wilson is a good friend of mine, so he'd be happy mm -hmm. to hear you. Uh, oh yeah, no, yeah. he's the one who did it for me. I mean, when yeah. I read when I read his book Darwin's Cathedral, I was jumping up and down because here I am studying morality, and you know, religion it's kind of like doesn't make full sense in terms of, of the, uh, the evolution of morality until you get to a group selectionist perspective in which it, which fits perfectly with Durkheim and Durkheim's my favorite social scientist, um, that religions are about binding groups together. That's one of the essential social functions. So yeah, it might begin with a cognitive error, but it, to the extent that it became adaptive in some, some cultures found ways of creating cultural practices that then activated innate mental circuits in ways that had beneficial group outcomes. And that all happened, I think, just in the last 100,000 years. So I think there might have been some group selection before, because even chimpanzees have intergroup violence. But I think the real period of group selection was the last 100,000 years, when we become a really tribal species. Got it. Now, in The Consuming Insight, one of my books, I talk about uh, the uh, kosher edict mm -hmm. against eating shellfish. And I, I get into a whole analysis how uh, it could have easily come about be because of the desire to solve a very real biological problem, which is once in a while somebody eats one of these things and drops dead. And there mm -hmm. is no way to understand sort of a statistical regularity in this phenomenon. And therefore, we ultimately blame it on some divine malediction. Uh, mm -hmm. do, you, do, you, do you buy that a <clears throat> lot of religious edicts are ultimately ways by which people tried their best to make sense of the world around them? Um, hmm. well, yes, although it's not so much an individual, it's the way groups make sense and groups are doing a lot of things with it. So, you know, kosher laws and all these religious edicts, they have this maddening relationship with health, which is, it's clearly not zero, but it's very far from perfect. So, uh, you know, there are aspects of the kosher laws, you know, pigs are disgusting creatures when you see them in, you know, real human, you know, areas, they eat a lot of shit. And, you know, so, so um, the kosher laws have something to do with health, but a lot of it is much more symbolic than that. So thou shalt not see the kid in its mother's milk. Okay, that has nothing to do with health. That, I'm guessing, is like, you know, you're raising these animals, you know them, and it just feels wrong to, you know, eat the child of your of this cow that you've known for 10 years, you know, along with that. So it just felt wrong, so they did it. I think you can actually make more sense of the uh, kosher laws and of most of these religious prohibitions if you look at the emotion of disgust. Now, disgust itself has a clear relationship to germ avoidance, but it takes on many more symbolic functions as well. So a lot of the kosher laws, I think, are about disgust. So there's something, I can't remember where it is in, in Leviticus, I think, about swarming, swarming creatures. Now, creatures that swarm are not any more dangerous than creatures that don't swarm. But, you know, if you've ever seen like a bunch of maggots versus one maggot, or a bunch of flies versus one fly, it's just really disgusting. And so I think, you know, our forefathers uh, knew what disgusted them, and they banned it as an abomination to God. I did I a, think. I, I did a, by the way, one of your co-authors, Paul Rosen, I got a chance to uh, chat with him extensively at a recent uh, Society for Consumer Psychology conference. I think it was in 2014. A mm -hmm. uh, lovely guy, really. Yeah, just yeah one of the good. funniest of all psychologists. Yeah, and, and you know, once I think we were communicating by email and he had written to me something to the effect of, you know, I was getting pissed at some some paper that was being rejected and so on. And he said, hey, listen, 80% of my papers get rejected. And I thought, well, you know what? If Paul Rosen is working with these types of numbers, I'm okay. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't be so upset. Uh, but... Uh, I was going to talk about uh, a study that I had done with one of my former graduate students that very much deals with disgust. It looks at the three domains of disgust, the domain specificity of disgust, uh, pathogenic disgust, moral disgust, and sexual, uh, no, what's the other one? Yeah, I think sexual, that's yeah. sexual disgust. And so what we tried to do in a, in a consumer context was to prime each of those three domain specific disgust elicitors huh. and then see whether the downstream effect on, on the effect on, on different products. So for example, if you if you trigger a sexual disgust, then there should only be an effect when you're evaluating products related to say mating. If, if you're triggering pathogenic disgust, then the downstream effect should be let's say on restaurants. 
And so we tried to see whether that domain specificity would work in a consumer setting. Regrettably, mm -hmm. we didn't get an effect, but I think it's because right. our manipulation or our priming of disgust was probably too weak. What do you think? Well, well so... <clears throat> You know, that's one of, been one of the major areas of debate and disgust research. I mean, first, there are those who say there's, that disgust isn't a moral emotion at all. And I think the evidence is just overwhelming from so many sources that it is. And we've, I have a lot of those listed at uh, moralfoundations.org. Um, so there's hundreds of experiments showing that disgust plays a role in moral judgment. But what I've found, as I've tried to look for domain specificity, um, because my original approach with Rosin was to say just conceptually, you know, there's, there's sort of the core stuff. There's, you know, the stuff about dirt and germs. Um, uh, you know, which is like food, animals, and body product. Those are all about bacterial contamination. And then there's um, body envelope violations like deformity or, or amputation and death. And that's like this creepy, scary stuff. Um, uh, and then there's like uh, also funny stuff. You know, when we do factor analyses and, and multidimensional scaling of our early data, we always found that kind of a structure like the, bio, the bacterial biological stuff's in the middle, the sort of the death and envelope violation stuff is here, and then sort of like the, both sex and um, some other stuff was, was over here. So we all agree there's, there is a, there's not just one disgust and that's it. There are flavors of disgust. Um, and the group that came up with the three domains of disgust scale, as I see it, and Rosen sees it, um, what they call moral disgust is really just reactions to cheating. And, and, and it's, we don't think they got moral disgust. We think they just got the degree to which people use the word disgust for normal moral violations. Um, also, their sexual disgust, I think it's mostly things, it's questions like a guy runs his hand up your thigh. And it's all sorts of things that are not just sexual disgust like incest or bestiality they're like viol they're like moral violations of your space so i think that the uh, the conceptualization of disgust in that theory is is not really that that uh, distinct and i've found in my own research i find hints of domain specificity but there's also a lot of crossover so i i actually even this day you know i don't know what to say on the domain specificity question now in your case i think you list six in your moral foundations work is it, is it six? Am I right? Is that, is that right? Yes. Now, can you link each of those six uh, facets of disgust to specific evolutionary adaptive problems, or you don't you don't get into that stuff? Oh, yeah. Well, so so what you're talking about there is the six foundations of morality. This is moral foundations theory, uh, which I developed with Jesse Graham and others based on the work of, of the anthropologist Rick Schwader, also influenced by Alan Fisk. Um, and so this isn't about disgust. This is about look around the world, read all the books, read all the ethnographies, what are all the different kinds of things that tend to get moralized? And there, you know, what was driving us crazy was you had all these different taxonomies, you had the, the, the evolutionary theorists working, you know, just on like reciprocity and evolutionary stuff, and then you had the anthropologists ignoring evolution. And I thought, when I was in grad school, my two big revelations were, wow, evolution, you know, it's, you know, humans evolved and our, our, our brains evolved. And, and wow, cultures are different. You have to read the anthropological literature. And nobody had really put them together well. And so, um, so I tried to actually begin by breaking it down. What are the, what are the survival problems? What are the, what are the psychological systems that seem like they're innate? And so, you know, the clearest candidates are, say, uh, Trivers' reciprocal altruism. You know, you cannot find a human society that doesn't care about reciprocity. I mean, boy, is that deep and innate. And I've done research with, um, uh, with Judy Deloach and others showing that kids at the age of three or four already, before they can talk about fairness, they really don't like getting something if the other person got more. So um, boy is reciprocity innate, but man, it shows up differently across cultures. And you can do the same analysis for the attachment system, which makes us sensitive to issues of care and harm and abandonment. Group loyalty, uh, Rob Kurzban has research on coalitional psychology, hierarchy, uh, sanctity, and that's where the purity and disgust comes in is sanctity. Oh, and the last one is liberty uh, and autonomy. So those are the, I think, the best candidates for being the six foundations of morality. And not all cultures build on all of them. But if you if you have that sort of guideline, you know, the, if you have that framework, you can look at a lot of otherwise very odd cultural disagreements, like any culture war issue, gay marriage, bathroom rights, all that stuff. And suddenly they make a lot more sense. So, so, to the extent that there are these innate or universal dimensions of morality, then we can both agree that obviously there is some evolutionary explanation to explain this sort of Absolutely. universal trend. But then you've got the folks 
on the other end of the spectrum, the cultural and moral relativists yeah. who, who, of course, uh, negate all that stuff. And there's a great story which I've said before, and I'll repeat it here in case you may not know it. Uh, Sam Harris talks about an instance where he was uh, chatting with uh, a bioethicist who had served on the, the presidential uh, committee on bioethics. I, I don't know if it was under mm. Obama or who it was. And that person was very much a moral relativist. And at one point he was challenging her and saying to her, well, what do you think if there were a tribe of people whereby in their religious narrative, it said something like every fourth child, child, his eyes must be, might, must be gouged so that mm. you could see the light. And she wasn't willing, <laughs> she wasn't willing to pronounce yeah. a position that this was absolutely morally wrong because it was well who are we to judge and so on yeah what do you think of this kind of uh... yeah i i never get involved in those discussions for because there's the, the problem with them is it's just you just shouldn't be looking for universals at the level of specific laws um you should be looking for it at the level of the moral foundation so it's sort of like what if i said there is no food that is universal you know, other than water there's no food that's absolutely universal uh, and we had a big debate about it. And suppose it turned out that, there, you know, that we make toast and butter a little different from the French. And see, it's not universal. That's not the way to think about it. The way to think about it is like the taste buds. The taste buds are absolutely universal. And so there's no, there's no human cuisine that's based on tree bark uh, and lemon juice or something. I mean, it, you know, it has to please, it has to please the, you know, we like sweet more than we like bitter generally. Um, so, but cuisines differ. So that's the way to think about it is the foundations are universal, but then culture is really powerful, uh, and it builds on it. Um, the case, but you're bringing up the case of the, the standard social science model and all the resistance, you know, you know, you and I love evolution and boy, you know, it gets it from the right, with the creationists and it gets it from the left with the you know the social constructionists but um, but that's what that's what makes it so much fun what we do right because yeah. nobody doesn't care about something that we say everybody is pissed off in one way or another that's right that's right uh, so but the way that i look at it um so since i focus in the righteous mind i focus on our tribalism we're tribal species and this is the secret of our success and it's the secret of our lasting suffering i mean the wars the terrorism the racism all that comes out of our tribal, our tribalness. And so um, following Durkheim, I say, always, you know, always start your analysis with what does a group hold sacred? What is the thing, the, the, the sacred core, that if somebody were to question that or challenge that, they would be expelled, they would be beheaded, they would be, you know, we can't have that. Um, and on the academic left, it's racism. Um, where the academic left, you know, universities, I mean, we pursue truth, but even more than that, we fight racism. That's really what we're here to do. Not in the natural sciences, but in the social sciences and humanities, it's all about racism and then secondarily sexism and homophobia. Um, and so if, if the most sacred value is fighting racism and it just somehow got constructed for you decades ago, that if evolution is true, if humans evolved, then there could be race differences. Therefore, evolution is not true. It can't be true because if it were true, there could be race differences. And since there can't be race differences, you know, et cetera. So, so it's, it's an act of religious devotion to deny that there could be, you know, I mean, so I was like to, you know, I like to, you know, I used to walk my students through various steps. Do you think that animals evolved? You know, do you think that, uh, you know, bat sonar evolved? You know, and then you go through the human body. Do you think that the body evolved? Do you think that the brain, you know, and you sort of walk them up. At what point did evolution just decide to stop working for human beings? Like, you know, when was that? Well, so. well there, there's actually, I'm, I'm writing right now a, a invited piece for one of the big marketing journals. And I talk about in that paper something, but this is not my term. This is a term from someone else. I can't remember who it is. That it's called the human reticence effect, which basically exactly mm -hmm. speaks to what you just said, which is that people are perfectly happy to accept that evolutionary mechanisms operate on every single other species other than humans. Now, if they agree that it, evolution works on humans, well, then you explain it for morphological features. We use evolution to explain yeah. why we have opposable thumbs, but it yeah. stops at the neck, right? That's Something right. mysterious happens above the neck that can't be due to, to evolution. And that's right. Now, is your feeling in, in the world, in, in, in the academic world that you navigate in, that a a growing uh, acceptance of evolutionary approaches in the social sciences mm -hmm. is, is finding its way, or do you find that it hasn't changed much? Well, so it never really, so I'm a social psychologist, and I'd say in the 80s, just before I got to grad school, in the 80s, probably it was on the outs. 
Um, and then Steve Pinker and Lita Cosmides and, and David Buss, that group in the early 90s, they kind of relaunched it. So as for as long as I've been in the academy, um, in social psych, it was fine. You had to be a little careful about it. But, you know, social psychology is not a crazy field. It's not, it's, a, you know, as we'll get to, you know, it's a, it leans very far left, but it's not overly politicized. Um, but in the humanities, yeah, I think they're nuts over there. I mean, I think they just, you know, it's because they're much more about activism and fighting racism. Um, so uh, now we we are seeing here and there, we're seeing humanists who are willing to look at, um, you know, Shakespeare and others in an evolutionary lens. So I think, yeah, you know, I think some of the craziness of the 90s is behind us. Yeah, I mean, I would say that, uh, I, I don't know if, do you know who J.B.S. Haldane is? The, is oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, my, probably my favorite quote of his, and I'm going to paraphrase it, is when he talks about the four st cognitive stages that scientists go through before they accept a oh, theory. Uh -huh. Yeah, and I, oh, so, okay, you're smiling, so you know where yeah. I'm going with this, but some people might not know it, so let me mention it. Uh, so, you know, stage one, you know, this is bullshit, this is nonsense. Stage two, well, this may be true, but it's a perverse point of view. Stage three, well, this is true, but largely unimportant. And stage four, oh, I always thought so, right? That's right. <laughs> right? Yeah, and, that's and, right. And, and it's, I find it so poignant because it, it, it perfectly captures my own career amongst consumer psychologists, right? Guys like David Buss and and Lita and John Tooby and so on, who've known of my work, they're like, yeah, great. You're applying evolutionary psychology mm -hmm. and consumer behavior. No kidding. It makes perfect sense. Beautiful. Right, yeah, that's right. That's and, right. And, and the other guys are like, what kind of heretic moron must you yeah. be to use biology, right? It's very frustrating. Yeah. No, but then right. you, you'd like to think that ultimately you'll be vindicated, right? Yeah. No, I mean, I think there, you know, there is slow and steady progress towards the truth, I think. The one point that I would really give those who are skeptical of evolution is this. A, a way that I've come to think about it, and what I always say to my students is, I'm a reductionist. I love doing reductionism. It's really exciting to find out that sometimes some things that you see at one level can be explained by what happens at the level below. But I'm also an emergentist, because the world we live in is not just buzzing, you know, neurons and, and molecules. The world we live in is a world of ideology and love and resentments and, and history. And all of that emerged um, from the interaction of, of, of individuals. And it's those emergent phenomena that the humanities is generally better at, or at least the higher social sciences, anthropology, sociology, qualitative sociology. So once you put it that way, that if you really want to be a social scientist, you have to be a reductionist. You can't have a principled opposition to reductionism, and you have to be an emergentist. You can't have a principled opposition to emergentism. And sometimes, you know, while my heart is clearly more on the side of the evolutionists, sometimes the evolutionists don't do as much on the uh, emergentism as they do on the reductionism. So that, I, I think, is an important thing that grows out of the tension, the arguments. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, so let's get into the, the, the political diversity stuff that you covered in your BBS paper, and then we could segue uh, to, you know, the greater... The issues that happen on campus. Yeah, but, Give us a summary of, of that brilliant paper. Oh, well, thank you. Um, so what happened was in 2010, the president of the Society for Personality and Social Psychology, uh, Todd Heatherton, invited me to be part of a panel that would address the whole gathering of, you know, the, you know 1,500 social psychologists in San Antonio, Texas, on the future of social psychology. And I thought about it. I said, well, what would I have to say about the future of social psychology? And I said, look, what I really want to talk about is the fact that we've become a tribal moral community. And I'm where well, everybody's on the left. There's nobody, um, nobody in the field who's not on the left, except for one guy, Clark McCauley. Um, and so I want to talk about that. And I said that to him. And he, and he said, sure, that would be great. That's a, we need to hear talk about that. So he welcomed me to talk about it. And I gave this big talk. And I went through you know, four steps about how hard I tried to find somebody who wasn't on the left, and I only found one guy. And, and then I showed how, you know, you can't really have a social science with no diversity. I mean, you know, you can't talk about race and gender and, and, and the psychology of conservatives and hierarchy and inequality, and all these politically loaded things, if everybody's on the left and everybody's pursuing a progressive agenda. Um, and believe it or not, the response was great. Um, you know, I, I did. I didn't try to, you know, stick people's, you know, stick my finger in people's eye. I did in a respectful way. And the, you know, the field, my field, again, it's not at all a crazy field. You know, people listen and thought, yeah, you know, that makes sense. Um, so the response was actually quite good from social psychologists. Um, and then a few social psychologists, but you know, then nothing really changed. I mean, it's hard to change. Um, so, but a few people in the audience, a few people who heard about my talk. Uh, wrote to me and said, "Hey, you know, let, uh, let's let's write this up." And uh, a grad student named Joe Duarte uh, wrote this amazing 
critique of, of, of some of some politically biased work. Anyway, so we got a team together of six people, including Phil Tetlock, Lee Justin, Jared Crawford, Joe Duarte, um, um, and um, um, and so we wrote up this paper, and it took a couple of years to write it up, uh, and it happened to come out last September, uh, and just you know this is just. Unrelated to all the other stuff that happened last fall, just it came out last September, uh, and making the case that you can't that we didn't make the moral case. We just said if you have no political diversity, it damages the quality of the science, and we didn't want it to just fade into the ether after it came out. And I was I'd met up with some other people in other fields who said it's the same problem. The sociology grad student. Um, oh, that's probably much much worse than social psychology, right? It is. It yeah. turns out that's right. That's what we're learning. There's so actually. Sociology- sorry, before you go on, let me just interject. There's a paper that I often cite uh, by some guys who did a study in out of California. Eleven, I think it was eleven. Uh, uh, universities that they looked at. The demo- oh yeah, there's Dan Klein. And, exactly. Uh, yeah, and and yeah. the number one field that had that was most lopsided, forty-four to one toward yeah. Democrats, was sociology. Then I'm guessing they didn't have anthropology in the sample. Uh, because <laughs> you it, think no, that's because, worse? Is that right? You know, yeah, anthro, yeah, cause, yeah, anthro. Because I because I, I know of one conservative. I know of two conservative sociologists, and I don't. I've never heard of a conservative anthropologist. That's a unicorn. It doesn't exist. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah, so yeah, so anthro and sociology are by far the worst, uh, and and economics is fine because they actually have uh, they have libertarians. And wait, my, my there we are. My automatic light just went out. Right. Um, so anyway, just to make a long story short, um, we decided to create a website called Heterodox Academy. Uh, because we saw this is not just a problem in social psych. This is a problem across the social sciences and also law, education, uh, so many fields. Um, if only I knew of somebody who was prominent who's not included in that list. I'm referring to me. You mean, I'm oh. joking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we, well, you know, so um, I guess that the invitation is lost in the mail somewhere. I'm guessing. No, no. Guess what? We literally today, what I'm working on today is we are opening up the membership. Let me announce it here for the first time. Ah, there you go. We are opening up the membership. So originally Heterodox Academy was only people who have been writing about the problem of viewpoint diversity. So we have everybody who's been writing about that problem. It's about 25 professors. Um, But now we're realizing, okay, so we create Heterodox Academy and then all hell breaks loose on campus, you know, the, the Missouri, the Yale, all the protests, all the demands to clamp down on speech, to intimidate anybody who's not orthodox, to punish anybody who makes members of the six marginalized groups feel uncomfortable. Um, so the universities go insane with this sort of illiberal moral panic. Um, and now suddenly it's like, OK, who's going to stand up against this? If everybody's on the left... And most people on the left, the liberal left, are afraid to stand up against the illiberal left. So at Heterodox Academy, we've been doing more of that. And in order to do that, we are expanding the membership. You'll get your invitation tomorrow. I will email you tomorrow. Anybody else who's watching the show, for now, uh, we're just going to open up to tenured professors, for, just for starters. And then in a few months, we'll open it up to, to much more widely. Um, but we think we find that actually most professors actually believe in free speech and are a little bit concerned, at least, about the intimidation that's going on uh, on campus of minority political viewpoints. So anyway, we, we think we can turn things around next fall. We think that next fall is going to be very different from last fall. So how do you explain, I mean, someone like you or myself, we're quite vocal in, you know, in, in espousing the positions that we do. We worry about freedom of speech. We worry about all the social justice warrior. What what is it that explains the fact that our colleagues don't jump into this battle? Is it cowardice? Is it fear? Is it a combination of both? Is it it's not even in their radar? What do you mm-hmm. think, from your perspective, explains their silence? Um, let's see. I think it, it's a couple of things. Um, because, as I said, the religion of the academy is anti-racism, and so a lot of our colleagues are members of that religion. And, you know, if you're a member of religion and some of, the, you're, some of them are doing some crazy stuff, you kind of are willing to look the other way uh, until it comes and bites you. And we saw that, say, with, with the Christakis's. Nick, Nicholas and Erica Christakis are very progressive. Uh, you know, I mean, they have impeccable progressive resumes, but they've been savaged uh, by students for doing well-meaning things. So Nicholas Christakis will get invitation number two. Um, yeah. um, and uh, so they've stepped down from uh, as a uh, master or whatever the title is, yeah. but they're still at Yale, both of them. Correct. That's correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah, that's right. So it's partly that it's also partly I think what we really are in is the emperor's new clothes. So um, uh, so let's look at Yale, for example. So what happened at Yale after the Christakis were crucified by the students um, and you know, who demanded that uh, that President Salovey punish them and you know fire them. Um, 
within days, a petition was signed by 400 faculty members um, uh, in support of the students opposing the Christakis. And so I had one of my research assistants download, he just gave the names. They're almost all in like gender studies, media studies, English, they're all in the humanities. A month later, a petition in support of them appears, 40 people on it. They're all in STEM. And then some were also members of the Christakis' home department, so personal loyalty. Um, so my point is that in the humanities, I think they really are true believers. It's a fundamentalist religion, and I think they really believe it. Uh, but in the social sciences, I think they're not as crazy, they're not as fundamentalist, but they're actually afraid to stand up because they're afraid of being, everybody's afraid of being called a racist or a homophobe or a sexist. That's the main thing we're all afraid of. And, and do you think that that's what might explain why people are astonishingly tepid when it comes to criticizing one particular religion amongst the 10,000 out there. Oh my God, absolutely. Oh yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and as you probably know, I'm probably one of the only ones who is quite vocal in my criticism. And I'm always astonished to see, I mean, I, and I've mentioned this before, but it's worth repeating, uh, just on my Facebook page, right? Uh, my personal one, if I put up a something that is critical of a hick senator who's denying evolution, then I'll get all of my progressive academic friends to like it. Yeah. But if uh, the Orlando thing where 50 people were butchered, shh, absolutely nothing, zero, right? No, that's right. That's right. Because again, it's a religion of social justice. It's a religion whose central god is the, it used to be six victim groups. Now it's seven. So the sixth throughout our, I think we're about the same age. The sixth throughout, tell me if you have the same. It's so, so most of the controversy, most of the issues, it's, it's, it's African-Americans, yeah. women, and LGBT. So those are the three big ones. Then there's the three that are not as prominent, and that's Latinos, um, handicapped of any kind, uh, and Native Americans. So those are the six that have been the sacred victim groups throughout my time in the academy. I would say about a year ago, plus or minus a few months, I don't know, we you know, sometime in the last year or two, Muslims were added as the seventh. And so, and this has really caused all kinds of difficult situations on campus because you have all the be all the pressure now. You know, I've never felt there was anti-Semitism in America. Like I go to Europe, and I say, thank God my parents, my grandparents left Europe. Uh, obviously, you know, obviously even Russia and Poland, you know, thank God. But even France and, and Germany and Italy. Um, so I think, boy, you know, Europe, they've got an anti-Semitism problem, but we don't hear. Uh, but I think it's we're going to see it starting. Oh, it's coming. Uh, it's coming. Yeah, uh, yeah because, I, yeah. I'm sorry, I was going to say, I don't know if you, I mean, I'm also Jewish and we escaped uh, execution in Lebanon. We I grew up in the Middle East and we mm -hmm. moved to Montreal. Uh, and for, you know, 30 plus years, I, you know, I experienced experienced sporadic anti-Semitism anti that came from sort of random people. But in the last 10 years or, or so, as uh, certain demographic realities have been happening, yeah. it is becoming increasingly dangerous to, to show that you're Jewish in certain areas. I've had uh, personal approaches from students at my university who are Jewish, who say that they feel intimidated, they don't wear a kippah, mm -hmm. they don't wear a Star of David. Yeah. Uh, and again, uh, the demographic realities are only going to change for the worse in that sense. Yeah. And so yeah. we, we should expect that anti-Semitism will be on the rise. Yeah. No, that's right. And I would add to that. So, you know, so in Europe, it's there's the sort of the, the progressive left is very anti-Israel and sometimes anti-Semitic. And then the, the 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 Muslim immigrants are the, the that's where the actual violence usually comes from. But the, 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 those are two groups with very different groups that are anti-Semitic in in Europe. Um, in America, we've had far far less. But now we're beginning to see um, the academic left joining with the Palestinian groups on campus. But just I don't know if you've seen this now with the rise of Trump uh, and this alt right stuff. I, I don't know enough about it. But the point is, I'm beginning to see like. The classic, you know, far right neo Nazi stuff and a lot of really nasty anti Semitic stuff on the web as well. So, like, this is like everything about this election year is just <laughs> freaky. It's like, it's like, you know, feels kind of like the end of the world with all kinds of portents, but the rise of you know, various kinds of anti-Semitism is in America is is one of those portents, I think. Well, I, re I recently received a uh, private message uh, on my public Facebook page from a Quebecer, so a, a French Canadian, uh, who just spewed some of the most astonishing anti-Semitism at me. Uh, mm. And I, I warned him, I said, look, I'm, I'm going to make this public. And he goes, I don't care, advertise it. And so I started yeah. posting it on my public page. And, uh -oh. then he, and then he... A lot of people liked it. <laughs> well, a few. But but he then came back and said, by you posting it, you're harassing me. So let's let's try to work. Oh, no. Let's think about the psychology <laughs> here, right? So you tell me, Jew, 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 die. I tell you I'm going to post it. When I post it, I'm harassing you. 
Uh, yeah. That's a twist of logic right there. Judgment is a wonderful thing. You can, <laughs> you know, you can you can justify anything you want. So that's you, really funny. Do you think that uh, as more and more professors sort of throw in their hat into this discussion of trigger warnings and safe spaces and microaggressions, that we'll be able to redress the ship? Yes, I do. Okay. I do because where we are is the emperor's new clothes. So you know the emperor's new clothes story. The emperor goes, you know, is advised to, oh, you know, this, everybody knows the story. You know, he's, he's actually naked, but only a little child is willing to say so. Uh, and what I found is that as I've been writing on this topic, when I published this, that article called The Coddling of the American Mind with Greg Lukianoff, I ex we both expected we get a lot of pushback. We expected that, you know, there'd be some people supporting us, a lot of people opposing us. The number of people who opposed us on the entire internet that we can find is like 15 um, in terms of people actually wrote a blog post, the number of professors who has it written anything is three. Like, you know, everywhere we go, like people are saying, thank you. Right. That, you know, we love that. And so, so I think people are afraid to speak up. People are noticing how vindictive and punitive the climate has become, but they're afraid to say anything. So we have the emperor's new clothes. And what this means is that once a few people start standing up, others will. Yeah. And that's why we're opening up the membership at Heterodox Academy. Now what we want is we want to get hundreds of professors all across the country to say, you know, I may be on the left, I may be on the right, but I think we need some uh, some viewpoint diversity on campus. Um, and we're going to get people standing up. I was going to say that I think what ends up happening is that the social justice warriors are polit politically active. And so ultimately people overestimate their numbers because the silent majority is quiet and so nobody knows how many of these guys are but then as you said once you you sort of trigger the domino effect then that that wave that tsunami can very quickly uh, outnumber them right and and, and you right. and you're right because i receive as you said a lot of private messages from colleagues who say mm -hmm. oh my god i wish i had your testicular i mean they don't say testicular fortitude that's i say that yeah but they say something to that effect uh, yeah, hey, thank that's you. Right. So that's right. So we're going to make we're going to make it a little easier. And so, just for example, we're already seeing this among college professors. I mean, among college presidents. So college presidents, people love to make fun of them for being gutless and spineless. Um, and if you have a whole class of people that are gutless and spineless, you know, as a social psychologist, I have to assume it's not them; it's the job. They have very difficult jobs, a lot of political pressures. So all of the early college presidents caved in. They validated the protesters' narrative. You know, not Yale and Brown are among the most progressive places in the country. But for the presidents to say, as Peter Salovey said at Yale, we have failed you. We validate your narrative. Yale's a racist place. We will do everything we can to fight racism at Yale. Give us your list of demands. Um, so the early ones all rolled over, played dead, and validated their narrative, which then emboldened uh, protesters at other schools. Um, but then what happened, I believe, is that all those presidents got an earful from their donors, uh, from many people inside, from people who wouldn't speak publicly, but who said, what the hell are you doing? And a lot of people did what, I, what I'm doing, which is, uh, you know, I'm never giving a penny to Yale. I went to Yale. I loved it, but I'm never giving a penny uh, to Yale. I'm just so horrified by what they've done. Um, so I think a lot of people are doing that. And now we're beginning to see college presidents standing up. And the best example is Ohio State. I've talked about this in other shows, but you can just look it up. But, you know, the president there basically said what to the protesters that came charging in, uh, if you have a list of demands, forget it. I will never receive a list of demands. You're welcome to come talk to me, but you can't give me an ultimatum. Oh, and by the way, uh, when you charged in here, you made everyone feel unsafe. So we're going to have the police remove you in six hours. Uh, and if you're still here, you'll, you, we'll give you a chance to go to jail uh, for your beliefs. Um, so anyway, what I'm saying is I think the climate has changed. The fear is dissipating. The craziness of the demands is now well known. Um, and so I think you're going to see next fall, professors standing up, presidents standing up, and at Heterodox Academy, we're going to launch all these different tools and programs that are going to help people stand up. So I think we're going to turn the tide next fall. Love it. I love it. All right. So let's move from some sort of negative stuff to some of your new exciting projects. And I think there are maybe two, two projects that we might be able to talk about uh, okay. with the time that we have left. First, you're working on a new book, I think, on capitalism, where you have two tensions between capitalism as exploitation versus capitalism as liberation. Maybe you could talk a bit about that. Sure. So, yeah. So um, when The Righteous Mind was going to come out, I wanted to be in New York City. I had no interest in business, but I knew some people here at the Stern School. Uh, and so I got a temporary job just for one year uh, teaching business ethics. And um, while I was here, Occupy Wall Street broke out. And then suddenly, you know, I, here I was writing this book on how the left and the right see things so differently. And suddenly people are talking about capitalism in this, you know, 
I, I, I'd go down to Occupy Wall Street, and it was, oh, you know, the giant vampire squid with its tentacles wrapped around the face of humanity. Um, and then I'd go back to the business school, and it was uh, creating value, solving social problems, you know, helping the poor with business ventures. Um, and it was like, wow, this is really interesting that people could, you know, that this thing capitalism could be seen so differently. And as I started reading about capitalism and the history of capitalism, the wonderful set of lectures by Jerry Mueller um, um, from the teaching company uh, called um, Capitalism, um, and I had the feeling that I – that I first got when I read Richard Dawkins, The Selfish Gene. And if you, I don't know if you remember your introduction to evolution, but oh, yeah, I do. You know, it's, it's like, you know, it's like, wow, a few simple principles. And that explains, you know, all the animals. Can, and can, plants. Can, I, like, can I give you my opinion? Sure. What was, what was your enlightenment? Yeah. Moment? I, I mean, some, some of my viewers have already heard it, but some haven't. So I'll repeat it. it first, first semester doctoral course in advanced social psychology. And actually Robert Kurtzban was in that class. He uh -huh. reminded me later, uh, and the professor at the time, Dennis Regan, uh, so this was a social psych course, not an evolutionary psych course. This was fall 1990. Halfway through the course, he assigns a book by uh, Martin uh, Daly and Margot Wilson mm -hmm. called yes. Homicide, uh, explaining the universality of criminal patterns using an evolutionary lens. I saw that. I said, I, I now know what I'm going to do with my life. I'm going to apply this framework to consumer behavior. So I had the exact same epiphany. Yeah, that's right. And that's, you know, that's a classic feeling of enlightenment. I mean, you could get it from Freudianism or Marxism or feminism. You know, it's like a theoretical framework that explains everything. And so just when I was reading about capitalism, you know, I was like 47, 48 years old and I knew nothing about it. And suddenly I kind of understood, you know, how everything gets here and, and why it is that some countries develop and some don't. And the interesting thing is that it's actually a lot like evolution because it's basically – once you get evolution going, where you can get variation and selection, uh, and better variants outcompete less good variants, you unlock human energy. Anyway, so the point is, um, you know, I came to see that capitalism is fundamentally a good thing. I, I never knew that because, you know, if you're a professor in the academy, you never meet anybody who thinks capitalism is good. Except Niall uh, Ferguson, who wrote a book. I don't know if you know his. Yeah. You know, yeah. He, oh yeah, yeah. I no, think he, right. he so supports it. Yeah. So there are there are a few conservatives and they, obviously they're economists, they're libertarian economists. So it's not as though there's nobody, but I'm saying it, outside of economics and a couple of rogue, you know, anyway. So the point is capitalism is essentially a good thing, but boy, it can run off the rails easily. There's, you know, I mean, you get the same problem. traveled across Asia last year, the, you know, migrant workers, construction workers, maids and nannies. I mean, they're all exploited horrifically in the same ways. So anyway, so my point is that the, the left tells this story about capitalism being predation. And it's true. There's a lot of truth to it. And the right tells this story about capitalism being liberation. And it's true. There's a lot of truth to it. So how do you put it all together? And that's like the kind of, that's just the kind of story I love is like, how do you make, and so it just flows straight out of the righteous mind. It's the next book, the tentative title is three stories about capitalism, the moral psychology of economic life. And it basically is the continuation of the righteous mind. Now, are you going to use any, uh, evolutionary principles to try to navigate through those two narratives? Oh, yeah. So um, the first third of the book is on the big picture, and it's going to begin, uh, after laying out the two stories, it's going to begin with a sort of evolutionary consideration of human nature. Um, you know, how did – we're a tribal species, um, but we're also like really good at exchange, and there's a lot of evidence from the early record that Homo sapiens, as soon as they go into Europe – they're exchanging stuff over long distances, whereas it looks like Neanderthals weren't. So there's something about our ancestors that made us really good at exchange. So if you have a tribal species, but that's also interested in meeting other tribes and exchanging, well, now you've got the basis for trade and exchange, and that sort of gets everything off and running. And then you know, you get what happened with the agricultural revolution and what happened with the industrial revolution. So I'm going to be try starting with the evolutionary view and then getting more micro into history why did it take off in England? There are a lot of theories about that. Um, so yes, evolution will be, you know, again, reductionism and emergentism. Those will be hallmarks of the book. Can I propose uh, another angle to, to your story that from an evolution Please. perspective? So Please, I, I take notes. <laughs> so I would argue that uh, we are, notwithstanding the fact that in some hunter-gatherer societies, yes, there's egalitarianism and all this kind of stuff. We are a dominance hierarchy-based uh, mm -hmm. species. We like to create hierarchies. And to the extent that capitalism facilitates this, assorts people into dominance hierarchies, then that seems to be much more consistent with our human nature than, say, socialism or uh, communism. You probably know this quote. I love it by E.O. Wilson. He famously said he, he studies social ants where you've got yeah. one queen and everybody yeah. else is equal. He basically said 
uh, communism and Marxism, uh, communism and socialism, great system, wrong species, right? So yeah, <laughs> that's good. I'll use that. Thank yeah. You. So, so I think I think that's one way to basically argue for, uh, you know, which of these two systems fits better with our human nature. Well, yes, but I would, I would, um, I think the left it tends to dislike capitalism because it is incompatible with equality of outcomes. There's no way you could get that. But I would disagree that it's creating hierarchy. So um, a hierarchical relationship, you know, uh, you know, as you and I know, you know, we're primates. Primates mark hierarchy in certain ways, showing deference. You get small. There's dominance hierarchies. Um, there's a big difference between dominance and prestige. Fair so. Enough. So a capitalist society means some people get rich, some get poor. But, you know, I live in New York. There are a lot of people who are much richer than me and a lot who are much poorer than me. Um, and so there's a sense in which they have more prestige or less prestige. But there's no sense in which those who earn more than me get to order me around, tell me what I can do, whip me if I'm insubordinate. I mean, that's just in unthinkable. So capitalism does not create dominance hierarchies. It creates a prestige ranking. And that's much more benign. Right. Fair enough. Uh, and let's go on to business ethics. I, se I sent you earlier today a very small article I had written back in 2009 about uh, uh, Bernie Madoff. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. I read it. It was great. Yeah. Ethics. And at the time, I was basically remarking about this idea. And I, I think based on the little that I read of yours, you seem to support this idea that, you know, everybody, all business schools suddenly rush to sort of yeah. infuse business ethics into every single one of their courses. I mean, you're doing mathematical modeling, infuse it with some business ethics because we need yeah. to teach. And my argument was that I wasn't sure that that's necessarily the optimal approach. Maybe you could talk a bit about that. Sure. So, um, you know, in the article, you you point out that there are heritable personality traits and psychopathy in particular. So, you know, I think that is certainly true. But as a social psychologist, I, you know, I granted you, there's personality and it's heritable. But, the, you know, as we know from the Milgram experiments, um, the biggest source of, of variance in ethical behavior is slight changes to the social environment and the expectations and, 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 and norms and things like that. So, um, so I've started, so when I got here, it was, you know, in 2011 to the business school, and it was a couple years after the financial crisis. Um, and I was tasked with taking, you know, teaching business ethics. And I'd written in my book, nobody is ever going to come up with a business ethics class that makes people behave ethically. And then they said, okay, go teach business ethics. So the <laughs> You know, so the approach that I took was, okay, well, let's let's grab the social psychology by the horns. And if social psych tells us that we're not going to be able to stick ethics into people's heads and then send them out into the world where they'll use their ethics because of the power of the environment, let's teach them how to change the environment. So I started a, a website called um, ethicalsystems.org. And we invited a whole bunch of leading people who study uh, ethics and organizations and fairness and cheating. So, you know, Dan Ariely and his work on cheating, Francesca Gino, who's just a genius at, at experiments uh, um, on honesty and cheating. Is she the one who did the, the stuff with the paper shredder? Yes, that's right. <laughs> that's that amazing was, study. Yeah. That's right. That's right. So, so slight variations uh, can greatly ramp up or tamp down the level of cheating. So that's our approach. We think that if you take business ethics not as a moralistic endeavor to say you kids, you know, do right, um, but we take it as look, we're human beings put into into really powerful situations. Uh, things are going to happen. So in our course, we're going to look at the things that happen. And even though you're a good person, boy, when you're faced with conflicts of interest and pressure to perform, here's what's likely to happen. So. Here's what you got to look out for. Don't join companies that have that. When you become a leader yourself, if you start a company, if you become a manager, here's how you can change things so that your environment will have good feedback loops that will reinforce good behavior and stamp out bad behavior. So I, I think that actually social science can not solve, but can greatly improve the ethical profile of business. And if we do that, the benefits are just vast beyond anything we can imagine. I mean, the, you know, if business, if, if, Poverty is, is declining around the world because of the spread of markets and businesses. And if we can make those businesses behave just a little better, the benefits to the poor are gigantic. You know, the work that you're speaking of with this uh, website that you just mentioned reminds me of, and I don't know how much overlap there is, but I had a chat with Peter Singer. Do, are you, do you know who that is? Oh, yeah. 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 So he, he's got, you know, his, his, his latest sort of big 
project is effective altruism. And so in a sense, there might be some interesting overlaps because, I mean, he's teaching people how to, if you like, maximize their altruistic bends. And in a sense, you're trying to kind of tackle the negative, trying to suppress some of their negative qualities. Or, you know. Yeah, but I think Peter is still focusing on individuals making choices. Now, he's been effective at it. I mean, he's gotten a lot of people, um, you know, to raise their income and give give it most of it away. So his approach is working. I wouldn't, well, I wouldn't criticize it, but his approach is looking for the people who are essentially saint. It is looking for the small number of people who really can devote themselves to helping, helping strangers, helping others. Um, and my approach is to say the world of business is composed of vast number, most people basically, or, you know, certainly uh, most people, um, some of whom might be psychopaths, some of whom might be saints, but the vast majority are just normal people who would like to do well if they could, who would, you know, who don't want to cheat, uh, but who can easily be pressured into doing all sorts of things if everyone around them is doing it. So I think we're taking very different approaches. And I think, I think, uh, I know we're almost out of time. Uh, I think Dan Ariely talks about sort of this incremental mechanism where somebody is placed in a situation where, as you said, it becomes easy to cheat because others are doing it. And then it really takes a life of its own. And even though that person a priori started with a self image that says, I'm an honorable, I'm a moral, I'm an ethical person. Once you sort of trigger that cascade, yeah. you're off and running down the cheating lane, right? Absolutely. No, that's what, I mean, the slippery slope. I mean, it's one of the big features that you see in the Milgram experiment. And it's one that we see in business ethics all the time. There's a wonderful talk from Preet Bharara, the uh, U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York. I show it in my class all the time, um, in which he says, it always starts with somebody offering a reading of accounting law uh, or, or law that stretches credulity that maybe is plausible but a little over the line and they put that out there and nobody objects and so you go with that and once you've done that you go a little further the next time and before you know it you're so far over the line there's no going back <laughs> fair enough uh, any other projects uh, this has been way too short i'll have to have you back at some point but is there any are there any other projects that you'd like to uh, promote before we wrap uh, it up Let's see. Well, I think so. I've got so that I write the, the book on on capitalism, how to improve capitalism, uh, ethical systems, how to improve businesses, heterodox academy, how to improve academic fields. Oh God, that's I'm tired just saying that. So those are <laughs> those are the three. But if people, but if, if viewers want to go, I, I suggest viewers go to heterodoxacademy.org. Um, if you're in business in any way, go to ethicalsystems.org. Uh, and if you're interested in moral psychology, go to righteousmind.com. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Stay on the line. Thank you so much, uh, John. And we look forward to having you on the show again soon. Cheers. Great to talk to you, God. Thank you. <laughs>